Uh, well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at the start of the GRASP and Robotics series. Just as quick reminders, this and previously recorded talks can be found on our YouTube channel and our website. Also, throughout the talk, please submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, which should be like over here. Um, these will be answered throughout the talk, um, I mean, at the end of the talk through the Q&A panel. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce our GRASP faculty host for today's talk, Dr. Michelle Johnson, Associate Professor of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation here at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, enjoy the talk. <laughs> thank you, Gabby. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, for all that. Um, so it is my pleasure to introduce um, a fabulous woman in robotics <laughs> and who is one of my um, informal mentors and um, and she's known me since I was a new PhD student and I went to do a postdoc in their institute um, and so it's just my pleasure. I'm just going to talk, give you a little bit of background about Dr. Uh, Maria Chiara Corozza. She's an Italian scientist full professor of bioengineering. She was the Minister of Education and um, University and Research. She was a member of parliament. So all of you who think that you can't be a robotics and be a politician, she's here to tell you that's not true. <laughs> um, <laughs> she did that um, from tw 2013 to 2018. And from 2007 to 2017, she was the rector of Santa, uh, Santa Ana School of uh, Advanced Studies in Pisa. And she currently coordinates the neurorobotics area in the, the Biorobotics Institute at the Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna. So since 2016, she is the president of the, intern, of the Italian National Group of Bioengineering. And in 2016, 2017, she has been chair of the panel for the interim evaluation of, I'm not sure what FET means. Um, you might have to clarify. <laughs> <Black> <laughs> Huh? <laughs> Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I have right. an assessment for the European Commission. Of, okay, got it. Uh, of okay. uh, flagship programs. So oh, that okay. means that. Uh, okay, I'm doing uh, again this this year. I will do this assessment again for the European Commission. Okay, got it. She's also runs a startup company. She is a co-founder of um, a startup company in wearable robotics, which is a spin-off from the Biorobotics Institute. And since 2015, she serves as the board of directors of the Piaggio Spa Group. Uh, since 2018, she's a scientific director of the Fondazione Don Ginocchi, and it's a network of research hospitals dedicated to rehabilitation medicine. So um, without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Dr. Carozza. Thank you very much, Michelle. And uh, so I'm uh, starting, going to start my lecture. I share the screen. <clears throat> okay. So, uh, do you see my screen? I yes, think. I okay. So, um, <clears throat> so the title of my presentation uh, is uh, "Biorobotics for Personal Assistant: Translational Research and Opportunities for Human-Centered Developments." So, uh, you hear me well? Can you confirm, please? Yes, we hear you just fine. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, first of all, I would like to point out that I have a double position at the Biorobotics Institute, Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna, where I am uh, in charge of the neurorobotics area, but I am also scientific director of a network of hospitals, in particular research hospitals that are doing translational research in rehabilitation medicine. So, what I'm going to say is partly related to my research in biorobotics, but it is more recently related to uh, my experience as a scientific director running research in the area of clinical medicine, in particular research in rehabilitation medicine. And uh, also, uh, I am uh, <clears throat> working in, uh, in general on the impact of robotics and biorobotics in the society. I wrote some books and I am 
writing new books on, in, in, on such topics. So my lecture is also uh, partly related on the impact of robotics and research in rehabilitation robotics into the society and what are the main issues related to the development of robots for rehabilitation and personal assistance and what we can do in order to address the uh, societal uh, challenges that we have. So the main topics of my seminar are the following. So I will introduce the scenario, the digital transformation, rehabilitation robotics and developments in uh, personal assistance. And I will speak about frailty and vulnerability. So uh, these two issues are related to the coronavirus uh, pandemia and uh, uh, we discovered that frailty, frailty and vulnerability can be accelerated by uh, pandemia and uh, different uh, <coughs> stress. And uh, so we have to address uh, these uh, specific conditions by means of technologies and uh, see what we can do in order to uh, decrease vulnerability in people, especially elderly people. Then I will speak about social robotics in healthcare. In, on uh, chronic conditions and disability and the translation of research and some uh, future perspectives. So the first of all, I would like to point out that we are in the digital economy. We are living this uh, digital transformation of our economy. And uh, so our robots and devices that we are studying in uh, biomedical engineering departments and institutes are uh, uh, part of this digital transformation and uh, can be seen as part of and components of this digital transformation. So maybe we have to change our perspective in designing robots because we have to take into account what is happening in the digital economy in order to make successful new products, successful new instruments for healthcare system. So uh, this is the first point. The, the driver to measure the evolution of the, the digital economy is the evolution of global internet traffic. And uh, our robots are uh, platforms in, in, in a system which is dominated by this uh, change and transformation of the economy, which now is based on these platforms that were also so successful in this pandemia of coronavirus. And uh, so we, we, we are seeing a sort of uh, evolution of this economy for uh, main uh, uh, industries, which is destroying some industry and creating new industries. And we have still to see what is happening in uh, the healthcare system and how we can see this platformization of economy also in the healthcare system and how we can integrate our robots and instruments in this uh, scenario and how we can take benefit of that and use maybe platforms for the benefit of our patients and how to develop digital economy platform for delivering healthcare services and healthcare therapies and uh, different uh, actions in order to support frail and vulnerable people in living better. And uh, <clears throat> So uh, what are the main uh, uh, topics and the main issues of this uh, new transformation of the economy? We call uh, it uh, fourth industrial revolution. Robotics and artificial intelligence are for sure some enabling technologies for developing some uh, new and innovative services and products. We have also to take into account geopolitics and industrial leadership in order to support this transformation and take benefit of that. And for us, we are researchers who are working in biomedical engineering and for biomedical engineers, uh, the uh, a sort of uh, the, the goals of the sustainable development defined by the United Nations are the goals that are fundamental for us in order to steer and define mission for our research. And one of the goal is related to good health and well-being. So we have to develop new systems, integrated a new platform for delivering new services in this uh, uh, new transformation, and also to take into account accessibility and affordability 
and uh, frail and vulnerable people as a target for our development in order to match sustainable development goals. And uh, so we have in uh, geriatrics and in other medical area, a sort of evolution of the core concept of frail people. And frailty, frailty is fundamental in order to understand what is happening to elderly people and how biomedical engineers can develop systems in order to address frail people. And especially today in uh, coronavirus time, we understand that uh, frail people are more vulnerable to endogenous and exogenous stressors. And uh, a new kind of medicine is under development in order to address uh, this problem and to take into account from the biological point of view what is happening and how to develop a new medicine based on that. And uh, biomedical engineering and technology can be part of this development. And for doing that, we have to understand what is happening in medicine, especially for uh, what is related to geriatric medicine. Uh, why this is a concept which is important? Because I strongly believe that uh, we have the, here a representation of functional decay in elderly people and we have normal aging and the decrease of abilities in activities of daily living which is happening for in normal aging. And we have to use technology for disability prevention to keep independent people independent and uh, to avoid this acceleration of aging, which is happening due to some uh, endogenous or exogenous causes, as for example, in COVID-19, uh, when uh, the disease appears, there is a sort of acceleration of aging factors and, and a person is, is going from this curve, normal aging, into this curve where some disability in activities of daily living is appearing. So I strongly believe that we have to address this acceleration and to provide all services and technologies that are useful in order to uh, prevent this acceleration. And that rehabilitation is important in order to address this acceleration and decrease this risk. So, and there was a recent paper from the uh, World Health Organization on that and uh, trying to measure how many people would need and would take benefit from rehabilitation. And it resulted some uh, uh, paper, which is uh, fundamental, I think, in rehabilitation medicine, uh, where there is a sort of global estimate uh, a global estimate of the need of rehabilitation based on the global burden disease. And this paper is fundamental and I recommend students to read it because there is a sort of analysis which is fundamental of what rehabilitation can do in order to address uh, these needs and uh, uh, prevent uh, the acceleration of uh, vulnerability and prevent the decrease of functional abilities. And the, it resulted from this paper that 2.4 billion of people, individuals, had conditions that would benefit from rehabilitation. So for the first time, we had an official paper, uh, paper stating that uh, there is one uh, over three uh, people uh, uh, who who can take benefit from rehabilitation medicine. So rehabilitation medicine start, is starting to become something which is very important, where we can develop technologies and uh, scientific approaches that can um, achieve the objective of uh, delivering rehabilitation to many people. If we are able to develop affordable and acceptable instruments based on evidence. So we need scientific evidence, we need acceptable systems and also affordable systems. And uh, this is in the, in the same, uh, very same paper, you can uh, find a lot of uh, information about the measurement of the global uh, burden of disease, the years 
lived with disability, which are increasing, and this is the increase from 1990 to uh, 2019. And <clears throat> this results in a sort of measurement of this burden, which has been also studied uh, disease per disease. So there is a, a sort of study related to all diseases and the risk factors for people. So, and frailty is important, is an important concept where we can see that six major international scientific society endorsed the definition as medical syndrome with multiple causes and contributors that is characterized by diminished strength, endurance, and reduced physiological function that increases an individual's vulnerability for developing increasing dependency and death. So these concepts are fundamental in order to address uh, this area. And also we have a specific uh, systems and framework where we can measure the uh, activities of daily living for people, all the activities and also the advanced activities of daily living, the instrumental activities of daily living, and this uh, decrease of the abilities, uh, which is causing the shift from autonomy to dependence. So is social robotic an answer to that? Can we develop social robots for overcoming this uh, uh, frailty and giving to people the possibility of being active, of receiving uh, 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 therapies, cognitive and physical therapies and improve the quality of life and improve their behavior in order to keep them uh, out of the risk of becoming dependent from external aid? This is an example of work done uh, in, in the framework of, uh, of uh, a European project, uh, which was uh, run in uh, Europe, so with European funding by one of my colleagues, Filippo Cavallo, who is working for a new uh, uh, social uh, mobile robot, which is also equipped with sensors. So the robot is intended for intent learning, but also for um, for delivering some therapy, but also for assessing the ability of people working with the robot. So more functions are added to the robot in order not only to deliver therapy, but also to become a sort of technical aid, but in addition to measure by means of camera and sensors and assess the ability of people using it. So new uh, perspectives are open to social robotics. This is another example uh, of a robot, which is a Piaggio Fast Forward US-based uh, company coming from Piaggio, which is developing a new social robot for accompanying people in the street and uh, providing support and logistic support as a personal robot carrying goods. So there will be a, a new generation of personal robot developed in order to support people in the quality of life. Instead of replacing humans in doing tasks, we can think of robots for enabling humans for performing tasks. And I think this is the new perspective of social robotics, delivering therapy according to this rehabilitation framework, but also assessing uh, people by means of scales and also uh, providing autonomy in performing tasks. So this was a sort of a journey of robot uh, from uh, industrial robotics in supporting production and manufacturing to uh, collaborative robotics in interacting with people in industrial environment, but also going to a uh, home environment and uh, the robot becoming lightweight and soft and more controllable and so uh, safer. And then the social robot accompanying people and entertaining people in the public environment. So now there is a new way of intending robots much more in collaboration and with human beings. And this new uh, area um, is an area which is expanding so much and uh, the forecast for new service robots for personal and domestic use are very good. And there was a measurement, specific measurement of the increase 
in this area. And I think that this area could be in, uh, in between medical and personal service. So we can try to match uh, this difference and bridging personal service and medical service and adding some new features to personal robots in order to increase functionalities and use them for assessing and supporting people. What is important and also a challenge for robotics is the definition of collaborative robotics, where we can uh, uh, in imagine robots for supporting people in doing tasks. And this interaction between the human operator and the uh, robotic system in order to improve the uh, performance of the final uh, assembling or manipulation or grasping task is a sort of challenge for robotics. First of all, for safety, because we have to put the robot together with the user. So all safety and security requirements must be matched. And also from the point of view of interaction control, because the robot is used both by a uh, human being and by a local controller and the interaction, the physical interaction between the robot and the, and the human being must be uh, must be uh, guaranteed in a safe way. So, and uh, this progress, I think, is uh, mainly related also to the progress of medical robotics because many sensors, like biospile sensors, tactile sensors, artificial skins, which are fundamental for collaborative robotics, are coming from biomedical engineering. So there is a strong relation between collaborative robotics and biomedical engineering and biospied uh, robotics giving some new sensor, new generation of sensors like, for example, artificial skin for improving the quality of robot and to make robot safer in order to go to the, to the patient. So my idea is that social robotics is going to the patient and in order to go to the patient, we must provide the safe uh, interaction. So we have different schemes, collaborative robots, wearable robots, implantable robots, and surgical robots. And we can see this uh, multiple uh, system has a sort of um, uh, loop where collaborative robots, we have an external robot interacting by human touch with the human user. And the robot is becoming smaller and smaller, lighter and lighter and flexible. And we need artificial skin and some sensors in order to detect interaction and to provide the safety according to the safety rules that are required for collaborative robotics. This was a real revolution in industrial robotics. And now this knowledge is coming to medical robotics in order to provide support for people in performing tasks in medical environment. Then the second level is wearable robots where we have an exoskeleton. So it's going not in contact, but in, it is worn by the user. That means that the exoskeleton is worn and the use that there is a biomechanical coupling, very difficult to reach and interaction control and assistance is provided at the link of the robot in order to perform some physical tasks and to provide assistance. And this is the second level, wearable robot. Then there is implantable robotics where you have some replacement of parts of the human body, like prosthetic legs or prosthetic arms. And here you have an intimate contact and permanent contact between the prosthetic device and the human body. Here we have uh, implanted and osteointegrated prosthetic devices as a frontiers for the future progress. That means that there will be a permanent link between the musculoskeletal uh, system of the uh, patient and the prosthetic device. And this link is more and more uh, deep. And then we have surgical robots or robots which are endorobot, internal to the human body, performing some tasks, delivering drugs and uh, delivering therapies and uh, moving inside the human body. So robotics is uh, not uh, in these schemes uh, uh, alternative to the human being or replacing, but it is entering in the human body uh, with a sort of progressive transition. And uh, we can see that medical robots are uh, integrating with the human body in order to support normal function. 
then I also would like to add some additional information about the evolution of rehabilitation medicine. So in this framework where robotics is playing a, a role in, 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 in this picture by providing support, by providing replacement, by providing assistance, physical assistance, and also cognitive assistance by social robots, we can see that rehabilitation medicine has been in evolution in the recent years and is changing a lot because we have not only technologies like wearable uh, sensors and systems, robots, nanotechnology for and the robots and the digital transformation. We have a transition in therapies which are more and more based on personalized medicine and the, the feed for for personalized medicine comes from neurogenetics, for example, for information about the DNA of the patient and the, the uh, structural characteristics from the biological point of view. And we have a new generation of biomarkers, which are useful in order to tune the action of robots in order to shape and tune the uh, therapy, for example, and in order to evaluate the outcome of the rehabilitation process. And biomarkers can be based on imaging, for example, on uh, non-invasive or invasive imaging, uh, re magnetic resonance, and much more. And um, all the imaging methods that we have also on biomarkers signals and biomarkers are fundamental today in order to measure, giving a sort of a quantitative measurement systems in order to assess the quality of the rehabilitation process in order to tune the rehabilitation process according to the biomarker evolution. And biomarkers are also used in order to give scores and evaluation and scales which can be objective. So in addition to the subjective evaluation of therapists, and the scoring and scaling and rating of the patient, we have some biomarkers giving some uh, quantitative support for the uh, diagnosis and for the evaluation of the outcome of the rehabilitation process. So rehabilitation is in evolution, is becoming quantitative, is becoming based on uh, evidence-based medicine and also on biomarkers that we can uh, use and develop. So a lot of biomedical engineers are involved with clinicians in order to develop biomarkers for evaluating the evolution of the biological system during the uh, rehabilitation process. So the rehabilitation process can be a motor uh, process uh, like uh, motor rehabilitation, but biomarkers are a sort of monitor of the evolution of the biological and metabolic, metabolic conditions of the patient. And uh, in parallel, we have seen a sort of uh, increase, impressive increase of papers related to the use of robo robotics in uh, rehabilitation engineering. This is an example of the uh, evolution and increase in numbers of papers that uh, were published on uh, robotic rehabilitation. So our effort is to evaluate this uh, science, uh, the science which uh, has been published in uh, journals and translate this science into evidence-based medicine. I think this is the further step for rehabilitation robotics to uh, organize uh, uh, RCT and clinical trials in order to provide guidelines and uh, evidence-based uh, uh, process in order to be part of the routine in rehabilitation. Because today, nowadays, we are not sure from the point of view of evidence based on uh, appropriate methods that robotic uh, solutions are uh, better or comparable or uh, 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 to um, usual care in uh, rehabilitation therapies. So for that reason, many uh, clinical institutions like the hospitals where I am working are developing new rehabilitation settings where uh, robotics is part of the clinical routine in order to develop clinical trials and to assess the different robots that are now commercial into a sort of uh, clinical settings in order to uh, uh, develop uh, guidelines for the use in clinical practice and understand how many therapists are needed for patient and the number of therapists that are uh, necessary to be involved in supervision of patients.
because our objective is to develop more and more rehabilitation and to uh, bring uh, uh, people to rehabilitation. Uh, we have high number of uh, people to be treated and we have to develop a, a successful system in order to supervise and introduce uh, robots for performing rehabilitation. So for that reason, we need a clinical trial. We need the RCT. We need to understand uh, uh, the comparison between uh, robotic rehabilitation and the usual care. We have to define usual care. We have to make comparison. And a lot of research groups are involved in order to develop. And in Italy, there is a major initiative in order to develop such kind of uh, guideline instruction for recommending uh, robotic uh, rehabilitation and for deciding if recommending or not robotic rehabilitation according to an appropriate methodology. And this is part of the task of biomedical engineers who develop such kind of studies in order to give numbers and to uh, disseminate the possibility of using robots and comparing the robotic rehabilitation to uh, clinical, uh, to usual uh, care. This is an example of this uh, uh, kind of approach where you have a normal usual care rehabilitation provided by therapist in a, 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 a clinical setting and you have a, a, a clinical setting where robots are used and the therapist is supervising the use of robots. So we have to make a, a, a comparison between the two approaches and to extract data with uh, enough statistics in order to provide guidelines for the use in clinical practice in routine. And for doing that, we also have to define exactly the outcome measure for the uh, robotic process and to develop a of its scale and maybe to evolve in scale for assessment and to develop uh, biomarkers and other systems to introduce to subjective evaluation of patients, which is performed by therapists in usual care, in order to add some uh, specific and quantitative and qualitative measurement system for performing this comparison, which is so important. <clears throat> And uh, so this is an example of the primary and secondary outcome using scales. So basically here you have all the ingredients that are fundamental. So you, we have to compare robotic therapy with uh, therapist, with uh, uh, super, supervising, with uh, uh, usual care, with uh, directly performed by, delivered by the therapist. We have to define the primary and secondary outcome, which is based on scales, uh, scales delivered by the therapist, by subjective evaluation. And we have, I think, in the, in, in the future to uh, increase and improve the primary and secondary and the bio, by using biomarkers and biological signals in order to improve our evaluation of the, uh, of the robotic therapy. Then, uh, before concluding this uh, seminar, I would like also to mention digital therapy, because I think that digital therapies are evolving so much, especially now during the uh, COVID the coronavirus uh, time, where we can use the combination of digital suite and instruments and wearable sensors in order to deliver some therapies. In that case, the algorithm for delivering therapies, that means coaching, recommendation, recommending behaviors, recommending uh, compliance to a specific therapy, recommending or uh, indicate, giving indication to patients can become algorithm-like and can be patented and registered as a digital therapy. So the great innovation of this area is that you can use applications and you can use suite and technological suite in order to deliver therapies in a diff completely different way. Instead of giving drugs, you are changing the behavior of chronic subjects. And this is fundamental in the digital economy because this is, I don't know what is happening, is uh, fundamental in order to provide uh, uh, some new use of the digital economy for giving benefit to patients. 
And uh, I think that uh, we have a lot of reports reporting about the use of uh, the second enabling technology that I mentioned at the beginning of this seminar, which is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning combined with digital therapy, which can provide this uh, new way of delivering therapy to subject by means of a new application. And this is revolutionizing the healthcare market. And I think that robotic in combination with machine learning can provide some solutions for following people, not only <clears throat> in giving cognitive, cognitive support, but also delivering uh, physical support and assistance and in a framework of a digital uh, therapy. And this is seen as uh, an important innovation in order to support virtual nursing, which is one area of development of digital therapy. So the digital therapies uh, will be part of a new scheme where we have virtual uh, nursing and uh, uh, coaching of patients by means of uh, digital therapies, recommending actions, compliance to, uh, to therapies, uh, uh, cognitive therapies, uh, cognitive exercises, and also suggestions for food, for uh, behavior in general, which is fundamental for chronic condition. So <clears throat> we can uh, uh, go further in doing that and studying how to perform translational research in order to assess these new schemes. And uh, I think we are entering in a er um, new uh, era where we will uh, develop uh, with creativity new systems for rehabilitation and personal assistance. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I, we have some examples. This is a paper on nature on digital therapy for mental health, providing virtual environment for training and for uh, delivering some uh, uh, personal therapy, we can uh, uh, create, cre use our creativity in order to understand how to develop the extremely uh, high uh, rate of uh, innovations that we can uh, develop on digital system in order to assist and support patients. And also digital therapies can be combined with sensors and with uh, robots in order to provide also physical actions and signals that, for example, in that case, specific case are giving a signal uh, related to the compliance of the patient to a drug therapy. So with some smart pills and compliance to therapies is one of the most important uh, issues in clinical uh, uh, management of chronic subjects. So uh, we have to develop clinical trial uh, units in order to advance research and to provide uh, evidence-based medicine. This is important for technology. So we, <clears throat> the roboticists have to enter into that and develop more, more and more clinical trials to assess our system. And we have to enter with robotics into a new scheme that we call rehabilomics, where we have uh, physical activity performed and delivered by robots, for example, integrated into a new critical clinical practice, which is already in practice in our hospitals, where we have drugs and pharmacological treatment. We have cognitive rehabilitation. We can also uh, delivery cognitive rehabilitation by means of robots and we have environmental enrichment where digital therapy can provide coaching to subjects in order to provide the change of behavior for subjects and everything must be integrated with the biological part biomarkers that are fundamental in order to evaluate the quality and the outcome of the clinical practice so on cell survival and plasticity, on reactivity, on inflammation, and also the neurogenetic part, which is fundamental in order to tune and personalize the uh, therapy. So these are feeding and tuning uh, the uh, choices and the decision making in clinical practice uh, and with these two functions. 
shaping the therapy according to the patient characteristics and also giving biomarkers for evaluating the outcome of the rehabilitation process. I think that uh, for the moment uh, it's all. I gave my lecture, so I go back to you in order to understand your question. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention. Wow, that was uh, awesome. Um, that was just uh, really um, cheers my heart to see you uh, presenting kind of a very future uh, look at where we should be going in this um, very complicated space of trying to have robots kind of really inserted into the lives of people, not just with disabilities, but all kinds of people. And I think um, I really am excited about the work that you guys have been doing. So we do, um, I think uh, Gabby has been keeping track of the questions. Gabby? So we actually have them on the panel. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so do you want to, at this point, to talk to, so what we'll do is we'll transition to where the panelists, um, we have three student panelists. Um, I'll introduce them to you and they'll be kind of running the Q&A session. Um, so the first panelist is uh, Michael Sobrafera. He is um, my PhD student. He's getting his PhD um, in mechanical engineering. He's in his fourth year, Michael. <laughs> Lose track of the time. <laughs> and he, that at this point, but yeah. <laughs> he's doing work in development of social uh, robots. Um, we also have on the panel a, a master's student, Jal Panchal. He is a, a first year master's student in our robotics master's program for GRASP. And he's also been working with me in the lab. And then we have a, another PhD candidate, Ab Brianna Stewart Haight, and she is working with Dr. Kocek, who, and I've been a co advisor because she's very much interested in the rehab space as well. And so they'll be leading this section of QA. So I'll, I'll give the, the floor over to them. Awesome. Thank you. And thank you for the uh, incredible talk. Uh, I want to start off by going back to your discussion of biomarkers. Um, and we found a problem in our research where when you bring these biomarkers into the clinic, uh, there can be a difficulty understanding them on the parts of the clinician, which can prevent uptake uh, and lack of usage means that we can't get longitudinal data on them. How do you really address that and make these biomarkers translate to the clinic? Um, okay, it depends on the biomarker because sometimes you have biomarkers which are more uh, uh, easy to understand, to be understood by a clinical staff, like for example, images or similar. But when you have uh, biomarkers which are uh, coming from uh, sensors or from uh, engineering approach, you have to translate them into some scales that are easy to be understood in real time by clinical staff. So if the question is how to make a clinical staff, uh, doctors, therapists, or nurses able to understand uh, this, this is exactly what uh, you have to do uh, as a, in translational research. It is a translation of, of languages. So you have to translate into something which is uh, close to their background and easy to be uh, understood and reliable. Very simple at the beginning, very, very simple. I don't know if I have answered to your question. I think answered it partly and also alluded to the challenge a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks for that amazing talk, um, so much um, to take in, um, so many questions. Um, but I guess one thing I wanted, um, because you talked about ro robot therapy um, a lot, I wanted to kind of um, ask you, um, so like creating um, effective robotic therapies is like one thing, but how do we get the target user, so for example, the elderly, to kind of trust the robots that we develop to improve their therapy treatments, um, given that they may have a negative connotation on robots, or because they don't understand it, they might not want to use them? Uh, this is a, a very difficult part, especially with elderly people. It's very subjective. So I think uh, we have uh, 
to give a, a specific function to a therapeutic robot. So not to use them for everything or uh, give the impression that we want to replace the human operator or the therapist or the nurse. That uh, uh, I think the appropriate scheme is to use together. So the operator, the, the human operator and the robot. And uh, there is a sort of um, media, mediation. So that means that, uh, uh, and the, the function I think, uh, for example, in uh, performing motor rehabilitation must be mediated and uh, performed with the support of a therapist. We cannot, for the moment, with present state of the art and robotic technology, replace the therapist and perform uh, a robot mediated rehabilitation without a human support being present at all. Uh, if you are speaking about cognitive rehabilitation, I think the best is to develop serious games. So for serious games, which appear to be similar to games that are performed, for example, on newspapers or magazines for elderly people to challenge from the cognitive point of view, you have to present those games like serious games, very similar to what they know from the experience and not far. So uh, by means of tablet or platform that are easy to be used in a very simple way. Thank you. Oh, hi, Maria. Thank you for the wonderful uh, talk. I had a question about uh, how social robots behave. So as the robots are becoming more social, they're coming closer to human lives and they're becoming more a part of our daily lives. So before when robots were part of the industry, they were more objective and now they have subjective responses. So there's a, there's a possibility of uh, cultural bias and human biases to be flown into the robots decision making. And that could have unintended impacts on people and how the robot is supposed to behave. So how do you think we should approach that or should we just embrace the cultural biases in the robots too? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very difficult. So your question goes to the point. I think that uh, it, it, we must be very clear on the use of the robot and to involve the patient in a sort of informed consent by explaining exactly how the robot is used, what is the purpose of having the robot and the final outcome and the risk. And uh, I'm not, uh, I don't like very much when we try to hide the robot into some toy or similar or game or similar. So if it is a robot performing some task which is related to the health of the subject, giving therapies, delivering therapies or similar, we must be very clear and very simple in order to avoid the bias and the cultural bias, which is to my experience, is developing when there is not such clarity of use. And uh, in Italy and in Europe, uh, the, uh, I'm sure that in the US there is a similar approach. Uh, in, uh, I know for sure the European framework where you have this informed consent, where you have to explain exactly the use that you are making on all data that you are collecting, the framework and the objective, and also the, uh, the risk of the use of the robot. And uh, that is a good basis for establishing a trust. So I think that it is a, a question of uh, being trustful. And in order to have trust of the user, we must be very clear. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so we've uh, got a question from one of the audience members, uh, PhD student Gadalia. And so he was interested in how we could use these sorts of robots uh, to bridge gaps in telemedicine that we're seeing uh, develop through COVID. And so he had a personal story where uh, his son wasn't able to be diagnosed by telemedicine. The doctor didn't think to do a thing on the exam that they do intuitively in person, but not over telepresence. And, and how could robots slot into that? No, I, I, I don't understand exactly the question. How we can use the robot to so uh, in person, uh, doctors know how to do a lot of interactions with patients. Right? Oh, okay. Um, in tele-rehab. They fall apart, uh, those interactions. And so can the robots help to bridge those interactions, do you think, the social robots and other technologies? 
and bridge the interaction between the, the medical staff and the patient, you mean? Right, right. Okay, bridge in tele-rehabilitation settings or in uh, by sharing the environment. I think we have to be to use our engineering approach to define what we mean for bridging. So if we bridge in the sense that we are sharing the same environment where we have the patient, the therapist or the doctor and the robot or in, in it is completely different for having the patient, the robot, and then in a different uh, environment or room, the doctor. So we have to be very simple and very clear and establishing what we mean for bridging. So we have to, I think, focus on this uh, triple interaction, the doctor, the robot and the user and uh, uh, use, for example, the robot for approaching, for emotional change, for engaging the subject and the therapist is supervising the action. This is one possible scheme. So we have to define the different schemes and try to implement and make experiments in situations where you, we have different schemes of interaction. For example, with children, we know that in autism, we have the use of robot for approaching the subject and the therapist is supervising. But in order to make that, this is the reason why I am uh, uh, in, in a supporter of the clinical trials. We have to define the protocols because in clinical application, we need protocols defining exactly which is uh, uh, doing what and what are the different functions of the different actors of the protocol. Okay, no, that, that makes sense. I think that's that answers the question in general. Uh, so there's a, another question from the audience. Uh, so it says, what technological barriers do you see as most critical to reaching the future of collaborative social robots as you presented? The technological barriers. <clears throat> I think the, the lag, the delay in the robot for reacting to some uh, unexpected event. Uh, so uh, the robot must be very reactive or uh, to be able to react in real time when we are speaking of interfacing the, the robot with the, with the human subject. So uh, it is important that the robot is performing what it's supposed to do and also uh, that the robot reacts and, and, and do what uh, the patient wants to do. And uh, so the communication between the robot and the user is fundamental. And for the moment, uh, we are not uh, very good in uh, doing this uh, uh, sentience. That means execution of what the patient is supposed that the robot must perform. So nurses or uh, therapists are very good in understanding and anticipating what the, what the patient wants or intend to do the robot for the moment is not very good in understanding that and uh, so uh, i think this part is fundamental so uh, my daughter understands me very well my robot does not understand me and uh, it is uh, we have to develop some uh, i think uh, reciprocal uh, um, interaction based uh, behavior to understand each other and this is common in humans but not in a relation between a robot and uh, a human and then a second problem is related to the exoskeletons for example they are not really performing uh, as expected so the development is very slow so wearable robots are very difficult to be developed because the biomechanics of the human body is completely different from the biomechanics of exoskeleton the joints are different the system is different and uh, also there are technological barriers which are related to the infrastructure the obstacles the furnitures the 
uh, architecture of, of the houses, which is very different and very variable for robots to be able to do that. So uh, we will need uh, years and years of development and experiments. Like for we uh, achieved with the Roomba robot, which is able to survive in house environment. We need uh, such kind of robot uh, able to survive and uh, negotiate in, in houses in order to be uh, mobile and uh, uh, able to survive and not to <clears throat> stop. Thank you. Um, so a little shift. Um, so like, so I understand that you have done some work on the policy side. Um, could you tell us more about that, you know, why and how you got into that type of work and kind of how it affects the research that you're doing? Uh, you mean politics? Yeah. Uh, okay. I, um, I decided, I, first of all, I uh, started to move into my university from the lab to management activities. So it was a sort of progressive um, uh, uh, evolution of my uh, task from being a head of my team to team leader to supervisor to uh, lab leader and then when I, I was uh, very good in uh, um, developing grants and successful in, uh, in uh, funding uh, collection and so my university decided to put me as a scientific uh, uh, director of the um, research division in order to like a sort of big grant office and then from that I evolved and then I was elected uh, rector that in Italy there is election uh, in the faculty and students for becoming this. And then just after uh, being successful in international uh, uh, projects and in uh, growing my university as a research university, I was noticed and the people in politics asked me to become uh, uh, head of the list uh, uh, in, uh, for the political election. And uh, I was surprised and then I ac was uh, accepted because I'm very curious. So finally, uh, politics, uh, I became a member of the parliament, but uh, it was more by being in the short list of people without doing really the uh, traditional curriculum. I was uh, asked to be part of this list as a sort of a scientist dedicated to politics. And in the parliament, it was really hard, completely different environment. And uh, so it was much simpler in the government because in the government it was uh, uh, managing like in the university. So it was not so different. So the scale was larger, but uh, the, the activity was very similar in university research education. But in the parliament, it is completely different. And uh, so it was really difficult, but uh, I am happy for, for that, I did some activities where, which were bridging between uh, research and politics, like international agreements on uh, space, on environment, on, uh, and uh, international affairs, which was my special uh, co committee in, in the party. And then I decided to come back, and, uh, but with a different uh, mission, because now I'm uh, devoted to translational research in clinical environment. So this is my story. <laughs> Thank you. I recommend you to do that. <laughs> but, but being elected is fundamental, because when you are uh, campaigning and uh, getting votes, it's, it's a very good experience. You have to understand people. And as a quick follow-up to that, again, from the audience, uh, what skills did you gain from your graduate education, from your university work, et cetera, that kind of translated into the parliament? Into the parliament, yeah. Uh, uh, first of all, the knowledge of international environments, uh, European Commission and similar, because I was used to European uh, grants, which are based on uh, international assessment and uh, uh, agency, international agencies, the knowledge of the uh, 
different environment in conferences, for example, in robotics, I was used to speak with people from different cultures and different uh, countries and different continents. And that was considered uh, good. And also the, my cultural background, because uh, um, I'm able to study <laughs> and to understand things before speaking. And this is not very common in <laughs> politics. So uh, I was uh, basically involved where there were complex problems in order to understand all ingredients of problems. Maybe not so good in making the negotiation, but uh, very good in understanding complex problems. So scientists are good for science-based politics, not, maybe not so good in following uh, negotiation and uh, similar with people, with communities, with stakeholders, with uh, lobbies is more complex. That's super interesting. I don't think most of us grads really think about those skills as being unique, but I guess in the broader world they are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Gabby, I saw you turning on your camera a second ago. Are we? Yeah, I think Michelle wanted to say a few words. Sorry. Dr. Johnson, you're muted. I just wanted to, to formally thank you, um, Maria uh, Chiara, as I usually call you, <laughs> yeah. for um, just your wonderful talk and being a role model for many of us in women in robotics and the work that you're doing and you're still pushing the envelope. And I'm excited to see what the next uh, few years hold with that. Um, so I just wanted again, thank you for uh, agreeing to do the GRASS seminar. And I know that we're going to get a chance, some of the women will get a chance to talk to you one on one. Looking forward to that. And um, thank you, everyone, for uh, um, attending the grass talk. I know that Gabby had a few extra words. Don't forget to unmute. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, please tune in next week. Uh, Friday, January 29th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time to welcome our next grass speaker, Allison um, Okamura from Stanford University. For more information on upcoming events, please be sure to follow us on social media or check out our website. Thank you again and have a wonderful day.